Uh, I share Oliver's, uh, Oliver's um, frustration that we deal with a lot of interesting issues, but we don't have enough time to look into them as much as we would like. And that's where help from academics is, 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 is very important. But obviously, this help has to be independent. And um, perhaps the Florence School of Regulation is the most obvious candidate for this, being part of the house, by the way, uh, the European institution's house. So um, also, there are advantages in having academics. There are disadvantages as well. Where is Jean-Michel? Uh, there are disadvantages, but there are also advantages Usually they're quite good at explaining, or at least they're supposed to be quite good at explaining things. Um, they teach um, students, and some of these issues are fairly complex. Um, they need to be explained properly before um, a policy debate can be started. And I'll, I'll give an example. So um, let's, let's see what I have in my wish list. Uh, we're approaching Christmas, so it's... It's fine. Um, now, there are, there are three items, main th three main items. The first one, and I think Oliver has already um, hinted to, to at least two of them, um, cost-benefit analysis, that's where we have most of our problems, um, whatever you want to call it. Sometimes we call it impasse assessment, cost-benefit analysis. To me, it's always the same. It's basically, and it's the basis of regulatory practices. Um, the regulatory test is usually um, is there value? Is there net value for what we pay? Are the benefits delivered to final consumers uh, greater than the cost? This is the fundamental problem the regulators always face. So, and we encounter this under different names in, in, in many aspects, even nowadays. And the first item in my list is the um, is is uh, infrastructure expansion. Uh, the TYNDP, as it used to be, uh, mainly the main instrument, is still the main instrument, but now we have the PCIs, the Project of Common Interest. And there in the, in the infrastructure package, the requirement for a cost-benefit analysis is explicit. In the TYNDP, it was somewhere there, but here it's explicit. Now, the answers are supposed to come up with a methodology for cost-benefit analysis, I think within, I don't know, a month, two months, something very short. Um, from the adoption, uh, some of the issues are really, really uh, complex, at least to me. Um, a piece of infrastructure delivers benefits in different areas. I mean, if, when it comes to sort of relieving congestion, that's pretty, pretty simple, I mean, pretty straightforward. I mean, you have prices in different zones. You can easily work out what's the, the benefit there. But when it comes to security supply, I mean, this was already hinted beforehand, usually you look at the value of unserved energy. Is this still really the best estimate or the best concept we have for relieving security or improving security supply? And uh, is this still valid in the sort of new context where you have uh, you know, intermittency and so renew security supply takes a different dimension? I don't know. Uh, what I know is that this will be a key part of deciding for the uh, new infrastructure to deal and to tackle the challenges of 2020 and beyond. And uh, so it's, it's, and I'm sure that NSOE and NSOG would be very happy if they get some good um, input from, from academics. So that's definitely one part of, of, of um, want something for, for academics, and I know that the Florida School is already working on it. But then I said, you know, this is also impact assessment, uh, cost-benefit analysis, impact assessment, in some, I mean, they have some common parts. Um, impact assessment is required. Martin knows that I don't, I'm not particularly enthusiastic about impact assessment, not because I, I don't like it, but because I think, as I said, as I said, it's beyond our, uh, way of operating. I mean, we don't have the time in most instances to stop and think properly, which is, which is a pity and obviously should not be the case. But um, what we can do is to identify the different policy options. Uh, what we should also do is to try to see how they score against each other. And that's where I think academics can help. Uh, perhaps in identifying policy options, that's something that, you know, Policymakers should also be involved, or at least should, or perhaps should lead the discussion. But then, 
From there to say, let's do a, a, a proper assessment of what are the benefits, what are the costs, how they can compare to each other, that's a something for, for academics. And we have, I mean, i just give you some examples without any pretension of being exhaustive, but very recently, you know, that uh, ENSO-E presented the network code on requirement for generators. A great piece of work. I mean, it's really, um, you know, f there are many new requirements which are necessary to, to keep the lights on um, in the face of, of a penetration of renewables. Uh, we issued a opinion where, in, in a few cases, we thought that the requirements were not sufficiently justified, i.e., it was not obvious that that was the least cost solution to meet the required objective. And that's, I mean, there are clearly technical aspects there, but also there are some um, sort of difficult concepts. When you compare uh, ways in which systems can address or connected um, installations can address the same problem, uh, then you have to compare to you know, uh, different solutions uh, technically, but also in terms of the cost, in terms of the synergy, in terms of externalities, etc. And I think that becomes um, you know, f a fairly complex. And again, it's where um, independent, because here actually the interest uh, playing around these issues are very strong. So you want the research, you want the academic input to be clearly independent. And I mean, again, we could... Um, capacity allocation congestion management was also mentioned. Balancing, balancing, for example, um, our framework guidelines envisage a European balancing market or an integration of, of the balancing markets, but how much of the interconnection capacity should be reserved for balancing? Uh, we said this would be subject to a cost-benefit analysis because the uh, traditional thinking was that the best the, best, the most valuable use of interconnection capacity is actually for commercial exchanges. But this was in, 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 in a world, the old world, not the new world, the old world where um, ancillary services were playing a um, marginal role, or you know, they were not, we didn't have the same problem of intermittency that we may face in the future. Now, if this is the case, should we revisit this um, sort of um, shared wisdom that most of the capacity should be allocated for, for commercial exchanges and perhaps um, do things differently. So, again, impact assessment, looking at the different uh, options, that's where um, academics could usefully come in. Um, and then, uh, so these are the two. And, and then the third one, um, well, Oliver has already mentioned that it will be in, in the communication, the capacity market for the future. Now, where, why a capacity market? Because with more intermittency, some reserve units will not be able to run, well, will be required to provide backup, and may, they may not be able to run as many hours as it would make it viable for them to run. So you need to make sure that there is some reserve capacity, again, differently from what we have in the past. The issue of capacity mechanism has been um, sort of in and out for, for, for many years. Uh, in most cases now there are mechanisms of sort uh, in most member states to remunerate capacity, but now here we are talking about having something which is um, you know, sort of common, um, common across Europe. Uh, my point is slightly different. I mean, this is clearly interesting. Um, how much harmonization do we require? But I think I see also another dimension. Um, capacity, <coughs> capability, and the, the range of opportunities from adequacy to short-term, real-time uh, response. Now, um, there are different concepts. Some of, some of these services can be provided by the same units. Uh, some may not be provided by the same units. And I think the first exercise that academics could do is to clarify the issue. Uh, I think there is still, you know, sometimes we talk about capacity and we mean adequacy, but some other times we, can, we, we talk about response. Demand side management and demand response are different concepts. And I think we need a bit of clarity there, and, the, and, and now is the time. The Commission will launch this week consultation. I think this is very topical. We need to, um, we need to hurry, in a sense, because otherwise some member states are already taking their way, and then it would be difficult to, you know, paddle back. Uh, into, into a European approach. But the first step, in my view, is to clarify the issues and to clarify that there are different concepts, they're interlinked, but there are different concepts about ensuring adequacy 
and making sure that we can sustain the intermittency of, of some generation capacity. So that was my Christmas wish list. I'm sorry, um, um, well, some of it is fairly technical, but this is a technical world, and, in, but, and, and for sure it's a world which tomorrow will be different from yesterday. So that's where we need the, um, the intuition and uh, uh, the capabilities of academics. Thank you.